Hello, everyone. I am Patricia Butler. I'm the CEO and co-founder of ArtistWorks.com. In case you don't know who we are, uh, we are an online music instruction company, and we work with world-renowned musicians who have um, kind of entrusted their teaching legacy to us. Uh, so if you want to learn something interesting or fun um, on an instrument, you can pretty much learn anything you would like at ArtistWorks because these legendary musicians have recorded just about everything that they know. Uh, so today is a very special edition uh, to our live dispatch from home. And the reason for that is because we're here with Tony Trishka and he's special as it is. Uh, but he also has a new album that is coming out called Shall We Hope? And it will be available in uh, late January, January 29th to be exact. And we're going to talk a lot about that new album today and hear a track uh, and learn about Tony's inspiration and this whole style of music. It is very interesting. And I think it's got uh, a lot of accolades coming its way. So to start us off today, um, we are going to have Tony play for us. Uh, and so without further ado, I give you Mr. Tony Trishka. Hello, everybody. I'm going to play on one of the banjos that I used for the uh, this Shall We Hope album. And this is a tune I wrote uh, during the pandemic. And uh, it's a nylon strung banjo made by Deering. And here we go. Tony, that was fabulous. Thank virtual you. applause, virtual applause. That was lovely. And welcome to my co-host here, Marcus Luscombe uh, from hey, ArtistWorks. Nice How's to going, have everyone? you with us, Marcus. Yeah. Tony, so what did you just play for us? Tell us all about it. Well, it's, uh, as I was saying, a new tune. Well, probably four or five months old now. Uh, there are not too many bright sides of this pandemic, but uh, I think people are being more creative when they're home. Uh, and have a little bit less to do in certain ways. So I've been writing a whole bunch of banjo tunes. Hmm. Uh, this was one of them, and I was trying to write it kind of in the style of a turn-of-the-century parlor banjo tune, you know, sort of something you might hear back in 1900, something like that, in that style. So, uh, And again, this is one of the banjos I used on the uh, on the album, So, which is what we're going to do today. We're going to look at various banjos that I used on the album as we're talking about the project. Yeah, well, this is, I, I've listened to just about every single track mm -hmm. only because I got special privilege um, and I have not shared it with anybody. But wow, Tony, this is really, I would say, groundbreaking. This is, I just loved it. And I'm, I just know that you're going to get critical acclaim to this. I, I feel very sure it's, it's different, uh, yet it is incredibly engaging as a musical experience and so i'm i'm very anxious to talk about this and learn a little bit about what like for instance what musical style would you call this and and what was kind of the inspiration and of course we want to talk about the musical instruments that you played um on it so um maybe i'll start off and then i know marcus has some questions so my first question to you is how would you categorize the music in, in this album, where, where are we going to put that in a genre? I'd have to say there is no genre. 
Uh, I mean, there's some spoken words, so right there we got a problem uh, in the, in the best way, of course. But uh, the first tune, the first actual song on there is called "This Favored Land," which was the original title of this album before it changed. And I don't, I wouldn't even know how to categorize it. It's not folk. Maybe it's folkier than anything else. It's certainly not bluegrass uh, or pop or anything like that. It's just, it's kind of, it's almost its own genre if that's not sounding too pretentious. And then the next tune, you'd basically call it bluegrass. But then I've got a Celtic tune uh, with Penny Whistle and Boron and that sort of a thing. Uh, this uh, Irish drum. So it's totally a Celtic tune, really. Uh, and then I've got two songs that have string quartets on them. And uh, there's a, I wrote a march in the style of a, of a Civil War period march. And uh, I had Van Dyke Parks, one of my big heroes from the 60s. He wrote, uh, he wrote the lyrics for a lot of the Smile album that the Beach Boys put out, you know, Brian Wilson's uh, unreleased genius project. Um, anyway, uh, I got friendly with him over the years and he arranged, uh, in fact, I wrote the tune on this banjo, but Van Dyke arranged a whole eight piece, basically marching band arrangement for it with horns and, you know, trombone and, and, uh, all sorts of things like that and tuba. Uh, and Van Dyke really likes, uh, uh, Calypso music. So there are moments in the civil war era ish March where you hear like these Calypso feels, so again, it's it's really all over the map, um, yeah. and then and there's one acapella thing that I did with Violent Femmes, where it's uh, five or six of us just singing in unison. So it's it's really hard to. It, I think it's uncategorizable in terms of that. <laughs> oh, I like that word, uncategorizable. Now let me write that down because that is extra points in Scrabble for sure. <laughs> Un, uncategorizable. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna use it. Don't tell David, but I'm gonna use it. Okay, um, secret weapon. <laughs> So the, uh, I'll just ask you one more question and turn it over to Marcus. The instrumentation um, that is in all of the album is unusual. And you've touched on that a little bit. How did you arrive at the whistle and singing in unison? Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about your decision making in terms of the instrumentation and the vocalizing and even some of the modes that you've chosen to, to play in. Well, some of them uh, I knew in advance that I wanted to have, I'd say there are five or six tunes that you could categorize, categorize as bluegrass. And I got the absolute best musicians uh, in New York City, although some of them have since moved to Nashville, as many people do. Um, uh, people like Alex Hargraves, who's one of the greatest fiddlers in the world, you know, he'd be a, way up in the top three. And an, uh, a woman named Brittany Haas, who's a wonderful fiddler. Uh, uh, just a, a whole slew of people. Dominic Leslie on mandolin, who's just a killer mandolin player. Uh, Skip Ward on bass, Jared Engel on bass. Uh, a, a lot of the New York musicians who are just the cream of the crop. And of course, most importantly, Michael Daves on guitar and vocals. He's all over this album. He was willing to do some kind of crazy things uh, that he was maybe a little out of his genre. Uh, he's one of the great guitar players of the world and one of the greatest singers I've ever worked with, to say the least. Uh, so anyway, I could put together a really great bluegrass band, but then um, th there were moments when just serendipity came in. Uh, for instance, I tried to recreate um, the idea of, a, of an enslaved African burial. Uh, I'm theorizing this would have been somewhere in the 1850s. And I researched this and found out at least that this one particular burial that I found out about from around that time that there would be a burial mound with various effects, personal effects of the person who had died uh, on top of the mound, including seashells, so that wow. the soul of this person could be transported back to Africa. It would represent the ocean of being transported back to Africa. And for the instrumentation, people would be walking around the, um, the burial mound and there would be a box with pebbles in it. And so I got mm. to the and we sent someone out to the hardware store to get a box. We found some pebbles. And then they would use a jawbone, an actual jawbone, which I actually oh, have here at home. Uh, but I, I got to the studio and I forgot the jawbone. So I said to the engineer, Lawson White, who's the best engineer I've ever worked with by far, who got such great sounds on this album. I said, oh, I forgot my jawbone. 
He said, oh, no problem. I have a jawbone right here. And he reaches up. What? There. And he had a jawbone, what? an actual jawbone. <laughs> he would scrape a stick across to create rhythm. Oh, and man. I had the amazing Catherine Russell play all the parts on this. Uh, I Know Moonrise is, is the name of the song. And she sang six parts and played all the percussion. And we actually recorded her walking as if someone was walking around this burial mound. So. Wow. Anyway, so there, and there were various serendipitous moments like that. Uh, for instance, on the Celtic tune that we will hear later on, uh, uh, Carry Me Over the Sea, uh, I'd finished recording the whole thing, and I added the vocal by Maura O'Connell, who was so amazing. And uh, I was listening to it. The whole track had been done, and we overdubbed Maura's vocal. And I said, boy, sh this needs something else. It needs like a penny whistle. And the engineer said, oh, I have a penny whistle. I play penny whistle. <laughs> Uh, after you leave, I'll, I'll add the parts yeah. and you can tell me if you like it or not. He's like this world class penny whistler, and you'll hear oh, that yeah. track that will. It's play. right next to the jawbone, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing. And I had another experience like that with, uh, well, I won't get all the details, but three times this sort of thing happened. Oh, I've got the jawbone. Oh, I've got a penny whistle, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, so, thank goodness. Anyway, so, and then um, I'd written two songs uh, where I wanted to have string quartet on it. And there's a guy named Greg Pliska, rhymes with Trishka. And he arranged, he's like amazing, totally amazing. I did this, um, I had the great opportunity to work uh, in Central Park at the Delacorte Theater. They have something called Shakespeare in the Park every summer, mm -hmm. which is free for, you know, when you stand in line to get tickets. And uh, Steve Martin had written music for As You Like It, the Shakespeare play, and asked me to put a band together for that. And there was some incidental music that was done by by this guy, Greg Pliska. And so when the show was over and I was starting to work on some of these tunes, I said, hey, would you arrange some string quartets for a couple of these tunes? And he did, and they're amazing. His arranging, wow. arranging is crazy good. So, And I could go on with all these other instrumentations. But... Well, we're happy to hear it, but I'm going to let Marcus ask his questions because I know he's sitting on a couple. Yeah, I've got a lot of questions, but... Uh... I guess I'll just start with the, the album title. You mentioned that there was an earlier working title, but uh, Shall We Hope, um, just looking at the liner notes, which I also got a nice early peek. Thank you for that. Um, well, adapted from a poem on the death of General Worcester by Phyllis Wheatley, July 1778. Um, tell us a little bit about how you came to find this poem and like what, what it meant to you and where did the inspiration for a lot of the story come from? Well, this all gets... No, okay. Originally, this was called um, uh, This Favored Land, which is the title track of the first actual song on here. And it's, I found it, I was looking for a title of this, and I found uh, uh, my son had given me a, a book of all of Lincoln's speeches, including his inaugural addresses. It was either the first or second, I think it was the first inaugural address. There was a phrase in there, This Favored Land. And I thought, what a great title for this album. Uh, and so I called it that. And um, and then, you know, in more recent times, it's says it's I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I love this country. I think it's an amazing country, but it, there are problems, you know, that as time goes on, uh, we get closer and closer to the ideals of this country and we're still not there. And it's going to be a while longer. But um, I just felt like it wasn't an appropriate title anymore. And so. Um, I had been given this book of poems by this uh, woman named Phyllis Wheatley, who was an enslaved African who arrived uh, at Boston and was um, bought by uh, uh, an upper crust uh, couple. And the woman took this seven-year-old girl, uh, she was seven-year-old, just in tatters when she arrived, and taught her English and taught her to read and write. And Phyllis Wheatley became a wonderful poet. And uh, in one of her poems, talking about the difficulty, difficulties of coming from Afrique, I think it was spelled A-F-R-I-C, meaning, of course, Africa, uh, you know, what a difficult uh, middle passage it had been. But in there, there was the phrase, shall we hope, that uh, my wife found. I was looking through some Frederick Douglass uh, writings and uh but my wife found that shall we hope and it just seemed like the best title considering all the things that are going on today um well without going into any more details it's a tough time 
it's just I'll just say that it's a tough time on a number of levels. And so Shall We Hope just seemed like a really positive kind of uh, a message. I mean, I don't want to be up on a soapbox or anything, but uh, I don't want to hit it too hard. But it just seemed like we really need a lot of hope these days. And so it seemed like the perfect, perfect title. So that's how I came up with it. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks for sharing. Um, one of the things I found fascinating about this album is just the story telling behind it. Um, even just looking at uh, the way that you laid out who plays what on the album, you've named them all as characters in the story. It's it's very much like a sort of a, not a concept album in that sense, but very narrative. Um, like for example, you've got Michael Daves as Cyrus Noble, the riverboat gambler. Um, I think you were telling me a little bit about this concept a couple of years ago when you were conceiving it. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Just where some of these stories came from and like uh, how you came up with them? Okay, well, uh, it's a work of historical fiction. There is definitely some actual fact, a lot of it, in fact, but there's also, uh, I, I took liberties with uh, you know, conflating certain characters and that sort of thing. It really started um, with a song called, I, I call it the Gambler's Song, but it's called, I call it On the Mississippi Here. And uh, basically, I just had this idea of writing a, a song about a riverboat gambler because on my last album a while back, uh, uh, an album called this, uh, called Great Big World, I wrote a song about Wild Bill Hickok, the Western guy. And I really enjoyed doing that, writing about a you know historical figure. And so I figured I just was in the mood to write some lyrics because I've written so many banjo instrumentals. Uh, let me write some, some lyrics. So I wrote this, wrote, wrote lyrics and made up this story about this riverboat gambler and did a little research on you know some names of the towns on the Mississippi and that sort of thing. And, uh, certain details of a steamboat. Um, in other words, like the Texas plank is just this phrase that, you know, it's, it's a physical part of a steamboat and it, it would add a little definition to the story. Um, anyway, and I wrote it to the music of a Jimmy Rogers blue yodel kind of a song. Uh, so I didn't have original music with it. I just wrote the lyrics. And then as time went on, uh, anyway, so I created this guy, Cyrus Noble. I gave him a name. And uh, as time went on, because I liked the other songs better, the music from the other songs that I'd written, I decided I better go back and change the lyrics to the, this gambler song and wrote all new music for it and uh, really liked the way it turned out. Um, anyway, so I had Cyrus Noble, and then uh, I decided that I wanted to write an Irish tune and have a woman in Ireland, and I wrote the story about her losing her husband in a mine cave in, uh, where the mine went under the sea and the ocean caved in on all the miners. And that actually happened in England. A friend of mine whose father was a miner in England told me this story and I just transported it to Ireland, to the west coast of Ireland. And so this woman wants to start a new life during the potato famine and takes uh, a coffin ship of exiled humanity is the line that Maura O'Connell came. And this is the song that you'll be hearing later on, Carry Over the Sea. And so this woman comes, Maura Kinnear is the name I came up with for her. She comes from Ireland to the United States and, and somewhere around the 1850s and ends up meeting Cyrus Noble, who's killed somebody and, and made his way to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And they meet and they marry and uh, they have a son. Well, she had a son that she left over back in Ireland, was keeping them safe, her, her, the son and daughter. I don't want to get into too much detail. I know I am, uh, but and uh, ended up sending for them when she got married and brought the, the son Colin, who becomes a drummer boy, in this. And then there was something missing, and I, I wanted to have uh, this element of you know slavery. I had to address that issue, and um, some friends of mine in Asheville, North Carolina, who I was staying with, the husband. Uh, teaches uh, history at Warren Wilson College in Asheville and said that he and his students uh, had been clearing a, a slave graveyard in Asheville and would I like to go the next morning? And I said, of course, I would love to go. And so we went out to this graveyard behind this church just on the outskirts of Asheville and you'd see all these stones just lying there on the ground. And a little farther on, you could see some actual gravestones, you know, grave markers, but you see these rocks and those were indicating, these stones were indicating that someone was buried there. These were enslaved Africans that were buried under the ground, but because they were they were just slaves and the, the enslavers, you know, just said, well, okay, we'll just put a rock there so you know someone's there. 
Uh, the person who took me out here, this history professor, did a seismic thing and found out there were 1,900 souls. Under oh, my. And uh, it was just this really powerful experience. Uh, and the, there was a grave digger, an enslaved grave digger for this plantation, um, whose name was George Avery. And uh, anyway, so I, I decided here's the, I can build a whole story out of this guy, George Avery. Um, and so all these people, there's a confluence of all these people through the story. So this thing just built. It started, I had no idea I was going to come up with this story when I started about 12 years ago and wrote this gambler song, the song, the Mississippi song. And over time, all these people meet, uh, you know, Maura Kinnear meets her future husband, Cyrus Noble, and um, this enslaved African who I changed his name to John Boston, and maybe we'll get into that later on. And they, <laughs> Boston and Cyrus meet in Gettysburg towards the end of the story. So I'm getting into way too much detail here. But <laughs> all these it's things fascinating. Things. Yeah, so. it's, it's fascinating. I'm. Um, I love the fact that you wrote music to a story. I I just find that brilliant. I really do. I'm I've been taking a a writing course and. It is so hard sometimes to come up with a story whole cloth from the very beginning, completely from your imagination. Yeah. And uh, what I love is that you have these very rich, deep experiences. I mean, you stood on the graves and that was an inspiration to you and that you created these characters is just fascinating. I think that the whole album is, is an experience. It's not just the music, which is fabulous. It's just an interesting experience that I find myself continually drawn to. I really think that it's 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 really a, a great work of yours. Um, Thank so you. I, mean, I do intend it to be listened. I mean, not that people have so much time in their days, but if someone can listen to it from beginning to end in one yeah. sitting, it's about fifty-five minutes long, and I think that's the best way to get the full experience. Well, and but yeah. I think further, you need bourbon on the rocks. I just think you know you need to just be sort of sitting there. Maybe have on your your muck boots or something and listen to this thing. It's really it's really great. Um, we do have some folks that want to say hello. Could we take that moment, uh, Tony, and and oh, let them say hello? Because we always have some loyal listeners, and I like thanking them uh, for being here. And then we're going to get to some music. We're we're going to get to some music. We're going to hear a track. I'm so excited. I can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay so susan thank you very much for joining us as this always it's wonderful uh to have you here um susan, thanks for being here yeah and roger's joining us from singapore so hey roger thanks for tuning in and julie is often in these events with us and i see a lot of banjos there do you know her tony i do know julie she's on my site and uh, one of my favorite people on the site she's very present and Oh. Contribute a lot on the shouts and forums. So thank you, Julie. Always a yeah, pleasure. That's nice. This guy, I don't know. He just, I think he's trolling <laughs> um, us. Last name Graves. Uh, <laughs> oh, I got Graves. <laughs> and here's Peg from New Hampshire. Nice to have you here with us. Dave Herzing, nice to have you here too. Dave plays quite a few instruments, including uh, the guitar. So it's nice to have him. Here's somebody you know, Tony. Abby. Abby. I think we've met before. I think Thank we you, Abby. Are. Yeah. <laughs> and here's Tim Kent um, from London, from the UK. Very nice. Very nice to have you here. Thanks for joining us all the way from there, um, across the pond, so to speak. And then we just have a couple more. Amy is from coastal Virginia. So hey. it's nice to have her. And then, oops, uh, Dave is from Australia. Hello, Dave. See a little banjo in his hand. Um, Richard is from Cypress, Texas. He's playing a banjo too. Look at that. All right. And George Malik. And then we okay. have Magnus from Sweden. Oh, hello. Where, I want to know, Magnus, where in Sweden are you from? Um, and then here we have uh, Cosby, who is in Delaware, Ohio. Oh, Delaware, Ohio. See, I almost missed that. I thought I thought Cosby was from Delaware, but I continued to read and saw that it's Ohio. I didn't know there was a Delaware, Ohio. Did you? I didn't. I didn't. No, no, I didn't either. That's fun. Okay, 
So I don't know who Vincent is, but he is at the 13 Steps restaurant. I enjoy uh, enjoy your uh, meal there, Vincent. I know Vincent. <laughs> oh, you do? Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. And then Dennis is joining us uh, from Japan. So thank you guys all for joining us. Um, it's really nice to be able to see where everybody is tuning in from. And we really appreciate having you here. And in case you're just joining us, um, we are uh, focusing today on a new album that Tony Trishka is going to release on January 29th called Shall We Hope? And now I would like to talk about one of the tracks I'm going to call it. I don't know. I'm caught in between eras. So it's mm -hmm. a, a tracks from an eight track, isn't it? So <laughs> yeah, this is only being released on eight track. It's uh, <laughs> has a limited appeal. Just, <laughs> just. It's a niche. It's a niche. Tony. It's a niche. Come on. Um, tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear. Uh, Tony, this is called uh, "Carry Me Over the Sea," one of my favorites, and I think we're gonna we're going to play uh, play the audio, aren't we? Well, I'm going to play the tune that this that this song you're talking about came out of. Originally, it was just a banjo okay. on, on this this cello banjo, which is tuned an octave lower than your regular G bluegrassy banjo. Okay. And uh, this is the song that tells the story of that very same Maura Kinnear that I was just talking about, whose husband died in the mine cave and she came to the States. And that story, uh, it's, it tells her story, uh, basically. Okay. But I originally wrote it on this instrument as, just as a banjo instrumental, which I'll play now. And then once I had this, then I built the rest of the song around it. The lyrics aren't to this, but there's an instrumental portion of it that um, has fiddle and guitar and the, the aforementioned penny whistle on it. So okay. I'll just play the instrumental once just so you can hear what it sounds like by Wonderful. itself. Wonderful. sound yeah it's so mellow and warm and, and rich when i first got this banjo i didn't know what to do with it i you know i played some scruggs sort of thing and it didn't feel right i tried to feel it and that didn't feel right so i wrote the tune to sort of find my way into the banjo and then once i did that then the scruggs did feel comfortable and fiddle tunes felt comfortable so i had a kind of win over the banjo or have it win me over. How big is the head there? How big is that banjo head? It's big. No, I think this is 12 inches. It's, so it's a little it's bit bigger. It's, it's open back on the back. And Very it's made cool. of gold tone banjos. And uh, they're making these low tuned banjos. They made so they make something called the missing link, which uh, Bela developed, Bela Fleck develops, and it's tuned down to C. This is tuned even lower down to G and a whole octave lower. Wow. So it gives you a whole other, you know, different kinds of inspiration, as you could say. Well, shall we listen to the music, Marcus? You're in charge of this one. What What sure, are we going to yeah. do now? Let's uh, go ahead and get that queued up here. I'm gonna I'm gonna let go of the controls then, right? right. I'm not driving. Yep, I'll drive what this one. Mom? Okay, here we go, go everybody. Here comes <laughs> Tony's latest single, "Carry Me Over the Sea." Gray clouds low and a handful of lime. A bad time. Smell of peat caught on the breeze. Lost my love near Port McGee. Mine shaft lay beneath the sea. Oh, 
Tony. Wow. Every time. Thank you, Mark. Shivers listening to that. <laughs> Thanks so much. So I, you know, this is uh, quite the piece. Um, I was just sort of reviewing the, uh, the, the lyrics and the notes as I'm listening mm -hmm. to it again, it just really transports, you know, I think I love that the most about this album is that it's so visual. Um, looking at this song, you've got eight other musicians in the fold along with yourself. Um, really curious like there's so much layering and things going on so many different textures um how do you approach recording a song like this like was this done in pieces or like what was your process there uh for mo the most part I, I really prefer to do everything live as much as possible so you really have a great band feel as opposed to okay let's have the bass and the guitar now we'll add the banjo and with this kind of music uh it's, I think it's much more effective and just feels better to have everyone playing together. And again, this band is so amazing. And this was with as the aforementioned Brittany Hawes is playing fiddle, Michael Davis is playing guitar, uh, Skip Ward is playing bass, Dominic Leslie on mandolin, I'm playing this. And um, I wanted to have a bull round player, which is this hand drum, this Irish hand drum. You have like a sort of a wishbone, not a wishbone, sort of like a drumstick almost thing. You play uh, with it. And, uh, 
there's a gentleman who sort of knows everything about everything Irish in New York City, and I got in touch with him and I, I said, can you recommend a, a bull run player? And he said, oh, this guy's coming from Ireland uh, in two days, like the day before I was supposed to record. And he's like absolutely one of the best uh, bull run players in all of Ireland. And so I was able to get him on here. And uh, so that was the basic band. We all played live. And I think Michael might have done a couple of extra fixes on I don't know what am I saying. Uh, there was no vocal on that at that point. We just had the track. And then I went down to Nashville and had Maura at her part because she's down there. But I actually had recorded the harmony parts on the, uh, on the chorus with a woman named Tracy Bonham who lives in New York City. And then I went down and had Maura add all the other parts, uh, all the leads. And I first saw her with a group called the Dan and back in the eighties and she just blew me away and we've become friendly over the years. And so I was able to get her. So basically it was everything except Maura on the original track, everyone, everyone except Maura. And then this, the engineer, John Mock, who was the amazing penny whistle player um, as, as he's engineering uh, Maura's overdubs. Oh yeah. I play penny whistle and did what you heard there. So he's really amazing. It's fantastic. Yeah. So cool. So I, I have endless questions on this, but, um, you know, like we talked earlier about the fact that you've got a whole variety of different banjos that make a presentation on this album. Do you want to uh, maybe grab another one of those and we'll. Sure. Okay. That was the cello. This is a, uh, a replica of a banjo made in the 1840s. By a drum maker in Baltimore named, uh, Boucher. What kind of strings do you have on there, Tony? These are gut strings. Real gut strings. Real gut strings. Which they actually, you can still get them for these banjos. And uh, this was made by a guy named Bob Flesher, who lives in California these days. So this is maybe 20 years old, but it's a replica, as I say, of an 1840s banjo. And as you can see, it's fretless. It has no frets. And has sort of a beehive hairdo on the end, this very cool uh, thing. And this is, a, like I say, an exact replica of this kind of banjo. And it was kind of a transitional instrument because when uh, the enslaved Africans were brought over, uh, in a few cases, they actually brought their instruments with them, but they brought these gourd kind of instruments. Uh, but then when, um, well, I could get into a whole banjo history thing. I won't, but uh, I saw an early ver a version of an actual real one of these things that had a gourd body on it, but this kind of a neck on it. Uh, so it's kind of a transitional instrument. And this kind of banjo was used in minstrel shows. And it's, it's uh, again, this was made by a drum maker in Baltimore. And so he just took a drum and put this neck on it. So it's kind of, this is kind of where the banjo started as we know it today. And um, I'll play maybe just one or two tunes from this minstrel banjo book that I have from the 18, uh, from 1855. It's the very first banjo instruction book that there was written by a guy named Tom Briggs and starting with a grapevine twist. So those are two tunes from 1855. That's how the banjo was played back back then. And that's like walking into a time machine. <laughs> playing this in around 1990, you know, they discovered these old books and started learning how to play the banjo in this style. And it's kind of like what we, I mean, it's basically what we call claw hammer today, but it's a little more open sounding. <clears throat> and again, with the fretless neck, and this is tuned down to D because in 1855, uh, the banjo, I mean, at least in this book, was tuned to D. And then a few years later, they tuned it up to E, like an open E chord. 
with the fourth string down, the fourth below that. And then it stayed there till about 1900, and then everything started being in G. So wow. anyway. When, when did actual picks become a normal thing? Was that much later? Uh, finger picks, I think, came in around the 19... I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think around 1920. But uh, I have this other banjo book from 1860 or 1865. I think it's 1860. And uh, no, 1865. And they're in there in the book. There's a diagram of where you would put the frets on a banjo. So around 1865, they started adding frets. And some people would say, oh, you can't add frets to a banjo. It will ruin it. You wouldn't put uh, frets on a violin. And so, um, but in addition to this fret marker, you could line up this sheet of paper with your the neck of the banjo. And some people would have flush frets or they would have just a piece of string or yarn around there so they could find where they were on the neck, which is how things started getting more complicated musically, a little bit more, a little bit more intricate once you could start moving up the neck and feel safe because you had these uh, frets. But on that same page, there's a, an outline that you can cut out you know, put it on a piece of brass or something and cut it out. And it would be a finger pick that you would put on uh, your index finger or middle finger to strike down like that to get a louder sound. When I first started playing this banjo in the style, I didn't realize that you should have a longer fingernail. I just had a short fingernail. And it, it's a little weak, but when you have the nail, it acts like a pick itself. But some people use these picks. It goes on backwards instead of the standard way you would have it like this you would flip it around and have it like that and hit down like that. So ah, the frailing direction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Technique wow. techniques. I love it. I know. Um, Tony, there's a, a, just a couple of questions. I thought that maybe we ought to ask you. Um, one is from Susan. And I think it's a good question because you sort of skimmed over the names of some of the folks um, in, in the, uh, in the ensemble uh, who, who who played the? You do know who played the Bodrin? I honestly, I'd have to look it up, and I'm looking it over right. Looking, I have it okay. right in front of me. Oh, Brian Mark Fleming. It. Brian I'm, Fleming. It was Brian <laughs> Fleming, Susan. Yeah, I met him that day, and hadn't seen him since. So uh, it's not like we're good buddies or anything, but it was Brian Fleming. And now we know. Now it's we Fleming know. with one M too. If you want to look him up, right. <laughs> Brian Fleming. Okay, that's wonderful. Is it B R I A N? Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. So then, one more question, if you don't mind, um, Daniel James White. That's a lovely, strong name, isn't it? Um, what's the wood that's used in the neck and the fretboard? Uh, you know, I think on this Andrew, he's asking about this. It's thing. some sort of maple. You can kind of see the see it in there. Yeah. And. Uh, the neck is the same. It's all just one piece of wood. Wow. That gives you that sense of that. Yeah. <laughs> and also, very notice cool. how many, bless you. Uh, notice how few brackets there are on here, these things here. They're just very few as opposed to yeah. a more standard bluegrass banjo that has more like that. That's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. can see that. I can see that. Do you have other banjos you right. want to talk about, Tony? That or any other instruments that you played? Any other banjo? Uh, well, I guess I'm just. Well, this is my main axe, as people call it. This is my main instrument. I played this on a bunch of the of the tunes on there. It's a Deering um, Golden Clipper, which is my signature model, as they say. <laughs> That's great. I love the sound of that banjo. I really do. I'm kind it's, of part of it. It kind of has these psychedelic inlays too, if you look. They're closely. so beautiful. Yeah, Let me it's called close up of that. Let's see. Oh yeah. It's made of a material called dichrolam. And uh, which is this, you know, really cool yeah. compound that gives you these kind of inlays. And the guy that um, designed, kind of 
he didn't invent it, but the guy that uh, sort of sells the uh, these squares of these kind of uh, of this material calls himself the Duke of Pearl. <laughs> Okay. Duke of Earl from those of us. Oh, a God. Tune, so All right, whatever. Duke of Pearl, yes. It's funny. I yeah, like it. It. It yeah is. I like it. Yeah, it's good. Um, so, Tony, um, yeah. what else do you want to play for us? And on what banjo? Because I'd love to hear some more music. I know we can't play anything else from the, the new album. That's illegal. Ben it won't is. let us do it. <laughs> You know, he's just, uh, he's a tough nut to crack, that guy. <laughs> My good buddy, how can you say that? Not easy. You can't, you can't fight back. <laughs> well, well I, I feel the same way because um, we're, we're going to be releasing um, another single later on. So, but this oh, is what good. Uh, but anyway, this is... Um, this is a banjo that was made by a Czech banjo maker because my background is Czech, so I've had a great opportunity to travel in the first Czechoslovakia when it was still communist a couple of times, which was really an amazing, I have some amazing stories from back then. And then um, when it became Czech, I've traveled there and, and toured with a group called Druha Trava that had been touring a lot in the States. Okay. Uh, and some good friends of mine there. But anyway, I've got to meet this banjo maker named Zdenek Rowe. ROH, uh, and he makes these bands. He's a great banjo player over there. There are some great banjo players in the Czech Republic. And uh, anyway, he made this banjo, and it's called a Rolls uh, banjo. And uh, I'm, because my background is Czech, I asked that if he would design uh, inlays based on the designs of a guy named Alphonse Mucha, who was the greatest uh, Art Nouveau artist, period. Uh, and uh, he lived sort of from the 1860s into uh, 1940 or something and had to leave when the Nazis came to power. But anyway, so um, I, I told uh, this banjo maker what I wanted and Zdenek made these inlays, you know, or I thought he made them. Wow. And it turned out that Alphonse Mucha's granddaughter designed these inlays, took his her grandfather's designs that I wanted Oh wow! Look at that. Very That's very did these inlays here, which is really amazing, and I, and even on the my golden clipper here, those are also Art Nouveau designs. Now, did she make them out of the material, or did she draw them and then he make them? Do you? Know? I think she actually she made the designs, and he actually is the one who made them. That's very cool. Like, and Luca really, was the artist that did all like the courtesan posters and the yes sort of stuff in France and that stuff back in the day, right? Yeah, well, he did a lot of posters for Sarah Bernhardt, the actress, and yeah, oh, yeah. I think if, if you know a lot of the uh, hippie posters from you know the Fillmore and whatnot, you just see yeah, these yeah. amazing tresses uh, with great detail, and they were based on Mucha's work. So wow. people, if they're not if they're not familiar with his work, at least uh, have seen people that kind of copy his work. So. Anyway, this is a low tune banjo down to E, okay. which is where John Hartford tuned his banjo. So I just have this slightly thicker strings on this. Oh, it has really nice, don't want to forget the, uh, the resonator. Oh, that is beautiful. That's like burl, mm. almost burl. It's it's quilted maple is what it is. Quilted maple, exactly. that's gorgeous. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'll just play, uh, I'll play a little bit of a John Hartford tune, a little bit okay. of a steam powered aer aerial plane.
That was this great. Is band, this is the banjo I played on that gambler song, that uh, on the Mississippi song. Yeah. So you can. Um, it sounds like bluegrass, but it's a little bit lower sounding. Kind of blends in with everything else. Yeah, so, I can tell that. I am. Um, I have a question for you, just to kind of re revert a little bit back to the new album. Mm -hmm. um, I know that John Lithgow played a role in the recording, but I'm not really sure what it was because you know what we have is just tracks. That right. I, what 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 did John do, Mr. Lithgow? I don't. Mr. Lithgow, let's call him Mr. Lithgow. Mr. Lithgow, he, um, well, I got to meet him through Steve Martin. I've gotten friendly with mm. Steve Martin over the years, and it's been a great joy and honor. And uh, I've gotten to meet some incredible people, including John Lithgow. And um, one of the main thing, one of the main aspects of this album when I, when I was starting out or getting into it a little ways was uh, as I was researching things, I did a lot of research for this album to flesh out details and that sort of thing. And I found that there was a reunion of survivors of the Battle of Gettysburg in 1938. There was another one, I think, in 1913, 1912, somewhere around in there. Um, but this was one in 1938. And these gentlemen from both sides, Confederate and Union, were in their 90s at this point, mostly. Wow. Uh, they came on stretchers and cane, they had canes. And one actually could walk you know, un unaided and did a little jig. And you can find this uh, on YouTube, which is where I found it. I went, holy mackerel, this is like amazing. Uh, this, uh, it was sort of like this healing moment. Uh, I felt like this would be a beautiful thing for the, to write a song about this, which became this favorite land, telling the story of these people meeting across the stone wall, shaking hands across the stone wall that they'd fought across 75 years earlier. And at the same reunion, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, gave a speech. And I found the speech and I thought, who would be patrician enough to sound like Franklin Delano Roosevelt? And I thought of John Lithgow, and I asked him if he'd be willing. Mm -hmm. It's not the whole speech, but it's a pat portion of the speech which finishes off the album. Uh, and he was willing to do it. So um, wow. we have John Lithgow's voice there at the end. And he's yeah. amazing, needless to say. And that's how the album ends. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it basically starts in 1938 with this song, This Favorite Land. And then goes through this whole, and then drops back into the 1850s, let's say, and then works us all the way back at the end to 1938 with this FDR speech. Amazing, amazing! So much thought and consideration has gone into this creation, and it's a real. Um, I, I like the word narrative, but it's also an experience, and I feel as though I can. Um, be very closely in touch with what your characters have gone through and what their um, journey was like. And you evoked that through the music. And I really appreciate the, the energy and time and consideration that has gone into this. You've done a lot of research. And there, I would imagine there are a lot of musicians that might have fallen flat with something like this and just played the music. But I think one of the reasons why this music comes across so positively and engaging is because you did do the research and it's, it's just the, the story has come out of you and it's come out musically. And I think that's one of the reasons why this is just going to be a very popular recording, Tony. I, I have, I have a very good feeling about it and I know I love it already. I love it. I think it's going to be wonderful. Thank you so much. And I've had a lot of input from people, especially handling, handling the, you know, stories of the enslaved Africans. I consulted yeah. with friends of mine, you know, African-American friends of mine, like am I, here I'm a white guy telling this story and writing songs for, there's a song that um, I have Guy Davis, who's uh, the uh, son of Ossie Davis and Ruby D, who have some pretty stellar credentials as actors. And uh, I wrote a song for him. Uh, as as an enslaved African. And, you know, it's for a white guy like me to do something like that is, you know, questionable. And I had to consult with various people to say, am I like way off base doing this? And they felt, I think it works, you know? Yeah, um, it's truthful. What you're saying is very truthful and very respectful and accurate as well. And so I I really like it. And I, I encourage everybody to go listen to the track uh, that you can get on tonytrishka.com. You can listen to it on Spotify as well as Apple um, and pre-order this album. 
because you're really going to enjoy it and you're going to want to play it more than once. Um, and I, Roger, who used to work for us, Roger Hall, just chimed hey, in Roger. and said, uh, yeah, <laughs> Roger, you, know, Roger. Um, you probably remember him, Tony. Um, oh, yeah, we do. He's wondering if maybe this story isn't so awesome that it could be a musical. And it is that epic. I think every, I'm not trying, I sound like I'm just really trying to blow this up, but it moved me and I, I love it. And it is very Tony Trishka. And I do think that it's somewhat epic, as I said. So, well, um, there, there has been thought of, you know, and we've discussed it. And of course, now all bets are off at the moment, but, you know, I, I've, I've had that thought to, have it become a theatrical production of some sort. And we've talked to some folks and of course now uh, there's not, nothing happening at the moment and not for a while yet, but I'm hoping in the future that it will have some sort of uh, theater theatrical. I hope so too. Right. We'll see what it turns into. Let's but, see. I, I want to know what role you're going to play. You should be a oh, general. I'm, I'm, I don't even want to be in it. I just want to like, I want to watch it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> all, and I'll definitely go. I'll, I want a front row seat. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, please see the scroll that's going across your screen right now so that you can um, pre-order, if that's a thing, order early uh, the Shall We Hope album from Tony Trishka. And you can listen to Carry Me Over the Sea once again if you want to just go to tonytrishka.com. Um, Tony, thank you for sharing your tremendous talent and music with us as well as your time. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you, Marcus, both of you. It's a uh, total so joy to be with you again. And thanks to all you folks out there that have tuned in here. Greatly appreciate your presence. So all over the world, thank you. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, and have a wonderful night, Marcus. Thanks for co-hosting with me. Yeah, good to see you both. Take okay. care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye, Tony. Take Hello. care. Thank you. Bye now.